All right. So this picture actually encompasses everything we learned yesterday. So as a quick review, right? We spent uh, the majority of the time just talking about segmentation, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we know now is that in reality, all accesses to memory on the x86 system are logical addresses, aka far pointers, where you must have a segment selector and then an offset into a memory segment. But what we found was that the segment selectors always seem to select, you know, index 1, 2, 3, and 4. They go from 0 to FFFF, being code or data, completely overlapping making it so that functionally, as far as we know segmentation permissions are concerned, all memory is read, write, execute, right? But we still said that there were privilege level checks enforced having to do with CPL versus DPL and CPL versus RPL. So CPL, if you remember, current privilege level, that is what defines whether you are currently ring zero or ring three, right? Current privilege level was defined as just the bottom two bits of the CS register. The CS register is holding a segment selector. A segment selector at bottom two bits as the RPL, but when it's CS, it's you know that's your current privilege level. So bottom two bits for segment select um, of the segment selector were your um, RPL, right? So going back to this right now, talking about the segment selector for CS, whatever the bottom two bits are, that's your current privilege. For everything else, uh, that has to do with you know what you're requesting. What, what the current privilege level is for the stack segment or the ES segment or the DS segment, et cetera. And it's saying, you know, I currently have a ES segment which has an RPL of three. This is my current requested privilege level. And I know the requested sounds like, you know, it should be the request of what you're trying to go to, for instance, but it's more like what you're currently at. And so when the hardware, when you're using that segment selector to try to access some segment, right, it selects something from the GDT or the LDT, and the hardware checks is the RPL, for instance, less than or equal to the uh, DPL, the descriptive privilege level, in one of these segment descriptors in the table, right? We saw the segment descriptors were 64-bit structures that had a base, 32-bit base, saying here's the linear address where my segment starts, 20-bit limit, which says Here's the size of my segment, and then the granularity flag saying this is a limit in terms of bytes or a limit in terms of four kilobyte chunks. Right? And then there were some other miscellaneous stuff. So, yep, that was the, <clears throat> the first major part was just learning about logical addresses, how they go through, find segments, how we find the GDT or the LDT, and how you take that offset and you add it to the base of the segment to get a linear address. And we said in the condition, when it's the case that the CPU is running in, without PHE enabled, then linear addresses map one-to-one -to, -one to physical addresses. And therefore, if you've only got a small amount of RAM, you can only access low memory addresses because your linear maps to low. Low linear laps, maps to low physical. If you try to access high linear, it maps to high physical. You simply don't have that RAM. Hardware is going to be like, I don't know what you're asking for. You can't access this high. But then we layered on top of it the notion of paging, right? And so paging was uh, to get you to the point where you take a linear address and it need not necessarily map one to one to physical addresses. So the point is, you've got some number of page directories and page tables, which the OS sets up, the hardware knocks down. The hardware automatically takes any linear address that comes out of this page, out of this initial segmentation translation, right? It gets a linear address as the output of its segmentation hardware. It takes the linear address, it breaks it up, and it uses the first part as an index into the page directory. And we saw a little bit about what each of those entries looked like yesterday. It uses the second part as an index into the page table, and the last part as an index into the page which is found within the page table. And it's just offsetting directly into that page and saying, here is the offset in memory where my actual data is. Um, and so, for instance, another point that we had yesterday was that the CR3, the control register 3, is a very critical thing to know that always points at the base of the page directory. When the OS switches around between context of user space processes and kernel process, etc., the how it handles the different memory spaces, which are potentially, you know, mutually exclusive, maybe there's no memory stored between two different processes, maybe there's a little bit of shared libraries or something which it's mapped into both processes. But the point is, 
the OS manages different directories and different tables for different processes. And when it wants to go ahead and switch into the context of a new process, it changes the CR3 register so that it points at the appropriate translation tables for that process. When it comes back to kernel, uh, the CR3 is set back to the, uh, to the kernel memory space, which covers all of the kernel modules and everything else. So, so that's the basics of what we learned yesterday, and we were just starting to dive into what the actual entries were. Uh, we did cover the fact that CR3 actually holds a physical address pointing at the base physical address of a page directory, and that page directory must be 4 kilobyte aligned. Each entry in the page directory holds the physical address of a page table, which must also be 4 kilobyte aligned. Each page table holds the physical address of a physical page, which must also be 4 kilobyte aligned. All right, so any questions on, you know, the overall stuff right now, segmentation, anything you want me to go back over again? But Otherwise, we'll just do a quick breeze through the stuff that we saw at the end of class yesterday for the page. Anyone on the phone have anything? All right, no one's typing, so on we go. All right, so we talked about, we said that yesterday or today, we're going to see four different types of this page table mapping. So, in the tradition, what we've learned about thus far is the traditional 32-bit uh, linear address space to 32-bit maximum of 32-bit physical address space, and you have four kilobyte pages. We said also there is the possibility to instead have these large four megabyte pages, and so uh, we're going to see that sort of thing later, and we'll we'll describe why you might use giant pages. And then we're also going to talk about physical address extensions. Uh, which is trying to get you your OS to have the ability to access up to 2 to the 36 bits of, uh, of bytes, rather, of RAM. And so that potentially gives you 64 gigabytes while still running a mostly 32-bit operating system. And again, there's a small page and big page version of that. All right, we covered the control registers. We said one is never used. We never care about that. CR0, it has two bits we care about. One to turn on paging and one to turn on protected mode. And you can't turn on paging until you get protected mode. So therefore, we know that uh, we know that in real mode, for instance, or system management. Well, I don't know. If it, I've heard conflicting reports on the system management, so I won't say anything. But definitely in real mode, you can't use paging. Uh, CR2 then. So we just got to the point looking at those entries yesterday, where we said a page directory entry and a page table entry is going to have a single bit at the least significant bit called the present bit. And that says, is there currently a valid mapping from virtual to physical address space, right? And the CPU, or the OS will be updating the page tables and page directories, right? So as it maps new memory, maps something into memory, it says, okay, I got to go update those page tables so that this new virtual address stuff maps to real physical address stuff and you load up a DLL or you load a new process and stuff like that. It's the OS's job to make sure the virtual memory space uh, makes sense and that everything that got moved from disk into memory, such as you know, binary when you double click on an EXE, the OS's job to make sure there is a ma valid mapping from the virtual address space that it, the binary gets put into over to physical addresses where it is copied from disk into physical RAM. Oh, and so the point is CR2, when the present bit is not set, when you ask for a linear address, which turns out the hardware goes ahead and tries to walk the page uh, directory and page table. If it finds an entry based on those, you know, breaking up the chunks of the linear address, if it uses that to get to an index where it looks at that entry at that index and it says, oh, you don't have the page or you don't have the present bit set, then it just automatically fires off a page fault and it sets CR2 to be the address of the code which was executing and requesting this other address which isn't actually mapped. So that means, you know, if your code is dereferencing a null pointer and there's nothing in virtual memory at the address zero, right, CR2 will get set to the address in your code where you have, you know, a move to zero or an add plus, you know, memory address zero and stuff like that. So CR2 gets set to the address of the thing which caused the page fault so that potentially the OS can sometimes fix it as we talked about with uh, paging in the paging things out from disk to memory. 
let's call it swapping for this class's purpose. Right? So like the Linux notion of swap, you say that if we run out of physical memory, we swap it out to disk. So the OS can swap stuff out to disk, and if it requires, if it needs to do that, it's going to set the present bit to zero, but then it's going to set the upper 31 bits to some OS specific data structure that helps it find that swapped out uh, data on disk sometime in the future, if anyone tries to access it. So CR3 was the most critical one as far as we're concerned. It always points to the beginning of the page directory. So if you want to go, you know, look at the page directory, you can pop open Windabug, grab CR3. Now, the problem is CR3 is a physical address, right? Or it's the top 20 bits anyways are a physical address. So you've got this question like, how do I go find the page directory if it's a physical address? I can't <coughs> if I type anything into the debugger. I'm giving it a virtual address. So you need to know how, what virtual address translates eventually to that physical address, which is in CR3. But uh, thankfully, Windows uses a special convention so that they always map whatever's in CR3 to a specific virtual address. And we'll go over that later. But, but that's how you, how you and the OS get around this fact that you know, you've got page directory entries, page table entries, and CR3 entries, which are physical addresses. And therefore, you can't just access them normally. You need to make sure they're mapped to a virtual address, which you know. We'll talk about how it does that later. All right, and then the last uh, few things were just CR4. That's where you do turn on or off physical address extensions. PSE is where you turn on or off the ability to even use large pages. So that you know, if the hardware comes and sees you've specified a large page in the page table or page directory, uh, then it'll go ahead and like send off a fault and it'll say, "Sorry, you've got some some you don't have page size extensions enabled, but you are trying to use big pages, so something's wrong." You as an OS designer should never have that problem. And then finally, page global enable. This is just where you do or don't have the ability to use global pages. And we said that global pages are all about caching. Because eventually, rather than walking tables, we want to go directly. This virtual page corresponds to this physical page. And let's just go one to one and then add an offset. And so page global helps enable that uh, so that those things get cached and not thrown away out of cache when you're uh, changing processor context by changing CR3. All right, so we said moving to control registers, that's just register to register form, and it has its own opcode that you can look up in the menu if you're curious. All right, we said the analogy here with paging was that you've always got to have CR3, which is the nerd who knows where the library is. Someone needs to know where the library is when you want to go get some information. Page directory is like the library. You go there, you look at the card catalog, and it tells you, hey, here's the 20-bit physical address for the book that you're looking for. So a 20-bit physical address gets you to a page table, which is the book. You go to the table of contents in the book. You index some amount past it. And you say, aha, this is the page where the information I want is stored. Right? That gives you the physical address of the page, which the analogy works out in this. So you've got the physical address of the page, you flip to that page, you find it, and then you say what offset within this page has the actual information that I care about. And that's where you get the actual word that you're looking for. Let's pretend that it's a dictionary it's the book that you just looked at. And so you're searching for a word data. All right. Yes. So is this all being implemented here by the OS? It's implemented in the sense that you know, the OS knows that it must provide a table with these page directory entries and page table entries and stuff. These are data structures which are specified by the processor. And basically, the processor is saying, if you, the OS, want to use paging, which of course not everything does, you know, MS DOS, no paging. But if you, the OS, want to use paging, you set these bits to turn it on. And the second you turn it on, you should expect that the hardware is going to be doing this sort of translation on your linear addresses. And the hardware is going to be consulting CR3 for a physical address. So you, the operating system, better have put this sort of table with these sort of data structures in it at that physical address. Otherwise, you know, the hardware is not going to know how to translate virtual to physical. So yes, it's implemented by the OS in the sense that the OS sets up tables. 
and it's executed by the hardware in the sense that the hardware automatically takes linear addresses, breaks them up, assumes there's going to be a table at CR3, wherever that points in physical memory, and then, you know, offsets some amount into it, checks the flags, says, you know, can, is it present? Is it read-write? And you're trying to, you know, is it read-only? And you're trying to write and, you know, throw in an error. If it's not present, throw an error. If your user mode code, and this is marked as supervisor code, throw an error. So it's like all of those bit flags and stuff, they're all about, you know, other checks and things that the hardware should be doing automatically. But then if all of those checks pass and you, everything's good, then the hardware just grabs out that 20-bit <coughs> assumes that the bottom 12 bits are zero because all these page directories and page tables must be four kilobyte aligned. It grabs out that 20 plus 12 physical address and it goes there to find the page table. And then again, it assumes you, the operating system, have correctly put up put these data structures in this page table, and then, you know, it'll lock the table using that index, and then it will, uh, <clears throat> and then it'll again assume, you know, this is how we get to the physical location. So does that answer your question? If the OS sets it up and the hardware traverses it, and it says it well? Yeah, thank you. I understand the division of responsibilities okay, better now. Good. <clears throat> So he's asking, you know, could you turn off on a per process basis uh, the paging so that there wouldn't be translation, right? So like if, it's, it's sort of like the case I talked about yesterday. Maybe you as the OS, you don't want to have to deal with these virtual memory. You want to know like I store at physical address this. Here's my page directory. Here's my page table. And I just want to go directly there, right? And so the answer is you couldn't do it on a per process basis in the sense that if you do it on per process basis, it also affects every other process and every other, and the kernel as well. So if we sort of go back, where was that picture? In the previous slides. If we go back to that one state diagram showing, you know, how you get between different modes, protected mode, real mode, SMM, things like that. It, it's because of this state diagram that it's not really, you can't think of it as being a per process thing. It's just like the overall CPU is running in protected mode versus, oh, we'll see that's, no, see now I'm just explaining, yeah. Uh, right, so protected mode is required for paging, but paging is not required in protected mode. So, so I'll show this picture again just to be clear, but so what I was saying was, you know, if you turn off protected mode, you dump down to real mode. But we said protected, protected enable. So this was right in this picture. It said CR0, protected enable. If you set that to 1, protected mode. <clears throat> you must set that to 1 before you can use paging. But actually, paging is not required in protected mode. So you could turn off paging and still be in protected mode. And you would still have your tables for everyone else in physical memory. So in general, I would say, Yes, you could temporarily do that as long as you had a way that all possible paths from the process to anywhere else, right? So assuming that all possible paths out of that process lead back to the kernel and the kernel can successfully uh, turn on, can turn on um, paging again, then yes, I think you, you could turn on and off paging for one given process or something like that. I don't think you would want to because it, it dramatically increases the complexity of what the kernel has to, to handle on return, right? So it's like if you turn off the paging for one process, you change, you, you turn off the paging, you're, you know, essentially the kernel is jumping to some specific EIP and letting that code run, right? The point is when that code is done, it needs to come back and the operating system is now also has paging turned off, right? So the operating system now has to do extra checks in order to say, is paging currently enabled? If so, turn on. I guess maybe that's not that big of a complexity issue. So maybe it wouldn't be that hard. Yeah. So I'll just go ahead and say yes. You can turn off paging, and it's probably not super hard. But it definitely has a little more complexity, yes. Um, so I know that in Windows, the kernel has visibility into every process's, uh, I guess, page directory in this case, right? right that's the on kernel it. manages all of them. And it's even Windows or Linux or anything else, right? Right. Whoever knows how to find all of these things, whoever has access to them, 
we see everyone's name. And the kernel also has its own page directory with its unit. So the okay. I, I think I was just trying to reconcile the fact that some people call the kernel's memory space flat, which is not really true. Yes. Right. It it depends. Yes, it depends on how you call flat, but uh, the kernel's memory space is non internally isolated, if that's the way you want to think, and that's probably what people are referring to. The notion that you know all of the kernel memory, nothing is protected from anything else, right? The kernel is protected from user space processes, and each user space process is protected from the other user space processes. Uh, Bill, can we go over to the board? This is kind of how I think of it visually. So how I think of it is that you know the kernel, everything considered to be running in the kernel right now, that's one big page directory, page table structures that covers a bunch of them. Now, this is the interesting part. So now while each of these virtual memory spaces for calc and notepad and stuff like that are separated from each other, they do actually have the kernel memory mapped into them. So right here, as I do it first, this is more like how things are protected versus each other, right? So calc cannot, you know, <coughs> just start executing kernel memory and it cannot read kernel memory, but how the actual protection, we talked about, you know, this disparity in segmentation protection yesterday, but we started seeing the beginnings, and you didn't see it because you left early, but we started seeing the beginnings of the, the um, Page level protections dealing with the supervisor versus user mode. So, in reality, for each memory space, for calc.exe, it does have all of the kernel memory mapped into its virtual memory space, but because of segmentation, it can't jump to that because it would be an interprivilege level transfer and it can't succeed because it gets ring three. Like, it gets all of this memory space, but it's a ring three segment, right? We saw it went to zero to FFF, it's a ring three segment. If it were to try to jump into the ring zero segment, it would have problems. But uh, more importantly, like, if it were not even trying to enter segment jump, right? If it were just trying to jump to these actual addresses, then the paging level protection would say, you know, this is supervisor, this is user. So the paging level protection, even though everything can be mapped into the same memory space, this will be isolated as the initial isolation was trying to apply. This will be isolated from health based on the fact that it's supervisor and the only way, and so in reality, whenever you're jumping in a kernel, it's doing that inter-segment jump and you're changing to ring zero. And once you're in ring zero, then you know it no longer matters because you are supervisor and this is supervisor. So it's the combination of those two which work in sort of a uh, sort of a funky way. So you may have all the kernel in your space, and you may think, well, I just call a library routine, and you know, it, it jumps into the kernel. In reality, during that call to the library routine, you're changing out of this virtual memory space into a different, you know, you're changing out of this segment into a different segment, and make sure I'm saying this right, and. Yeah, and because of that, because you're changing out of the segment into the ring zero segment, the supervisor level paging no longer applies, or no longer will prevent you from executing this stuff. But you are not necessarily changing an actual memory space. So this, your page directory, your calc.exe may call kernel, some kernel library, but you're not necessarily changing out of the page table translations and stuff. And we'll come back to this. Again, when we talk about the uh, caching, and I talked about that global page and why you would maybe want to mark the kernel as global so that this guy can jump in and out of there, but this mapping of all the kernel data is at these you know, physical addresses. Everyone has that mapping of the same kernel data is at these physical addresses so that uh, when you jump to a library thing, you don't have to actually transfer virtual memory spaces. You don't transfer virtual memory spaces, but you do transfer rings, 
And because you're transferring rings, the supervisor versus user doesn't matter. So similarly, Notepad has all of that in its virtual memory space based on this paging, page tables, page directories. But this chunk of the page directories is marked as user. This chunk of the page directories are marked as supervisor. And therefore, it can't just go there directly. In order to go there, it has to change up to supervisor level, even if it's still within the same page directory and stuff like that. Call its library and return. And so it's the only time you're actually getting this straight up like transition of like, you know, hey, calc.exe is changing into the virtual memory space of, of kernel is, for instance, when calc.exe is timed out. Like, the kernel is supposed to switch between all of these, right? It's supposed to give them all, you know, roughly equal time on the processor. So when kernel says, hey, calc, you've run long enough, stop. Right? And that happens by things like interrupts. Kernel gets called back, sets a timer that says, like, look, I'm going to let calc.exe run for, you know, 100, like, 10 microseconds. I don't know what it actually is. So it says, calc.exe, you can run for, we'll say it's, you know, 100 microseconds. And when that 100 microseconds is up, an interrupt occurs. Because of the interrupt, we automatically transfer to the kernel. We're automatically in the kernel's virtual memory space, which is separate from these guys' virtual memory space, and which doesn't have every user space process in it. It just has kernel in it. And from there, you're in that space, and then you can say, OK, calc.exe is done. Go to Notepad. And you do then transfer virtual memory spaces and stuff like that. So I know that's definitely a bunch to uh, wrap your head around, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep trying to come back to this and, uh, and show exactly where you know, when segmentation is actually in effect, when paging is in effect. But, but let's, uh, let's go through, let's get a little deeper into the paging again. So you can have, uh, have that in the back of your mind, but don't, don't worry about not understanding it at this point. Okay. Right. Any other questions at this point? Yes. Corey wrote yeah. a question. So in answer to know. Corey's question, we're going to get into that in a little bit, but uh, not, not ready to do that yet, but it is in the, the slides. All right. So. <clears throat> All right, so we saw, first we just went over the notion of like just generally speaking, <coughs> what do these data structures look like before we actually dig into them. And so we said the first thing is CR3 does hold a physical address of the page directory. So OS's responsibility to switch that up every time it wants to switch between virtual memory spaces. So it holds top 20 bits, the bottom 12 bits are always assumed to be zero because all of these page directories, page tables, and pages must be four kilobyte aligned in this type of translation. All right, and so there were two flags on this, PWT and PCD, and we don't care about those because those have to do with general caching of, of memory in the sense of, you know, I've taken a page out of RAM and put it into the L1 cache or something like that, and we don't care about that sort of caching here. We only are going to talk about the caching of this virtual caches to that physical so that we don't have to walk these tables. All right. Then we saw, you know, the page, uh, page directory entry. And we said that the top 20 bits are the page table base address. So that's a physical address where a page table starts. And the other bits are whatever they are. We're going to come back and talk about them in detail again. So you've got physical address gets you to the page directory. Page directory entry has a physical address which gets you to the page table. By you, I mean hardware. Once you're at the page table, it again has very similar looking data structures. And these data structures, once again, give you the physical address of the actual page which you want to map to, as well as some, uh, some flags. So in answer to your question yesterday, Ariel, uh, it does look like it's the case. So you asked why the, page, the global page is ignored. Why do they even have the bit on the page directory entry and stuff like that? And actually, I just thought of the other reason right now. One. It is ignored because in terms of global pages, the only thing they, they keep global are cache entries that say this virtual ends up at that physical, like the very final physical in these things. So it doesn't make any sense to cache to the page table first. But the bigger reason I think this is in here is because right now this data structure will be reused when we go to those 4 megabyte pages. 
And when we get there, uh, spoiler alert, it turns out there is no page table. You go directly from page directory right to gigantic four, four megabyte page. And in that case, then it does make sense for the page directory to say, yeah, I want to cache that four megabyte page. <coughs> so that's a big reason. All right, so but anyways, right now we're still in the mode where we've got page table, page, or page directory, page table, page. So we got through everything. And then finally, when you get to the very final page table, it gives you the actual page or a physical frame, as I also call them, address. So you've got a frame, and then you just take, the hardware just takes the last 12 bits of the linear address you were trying to access, and it turns that into a 12-bit offset into this uh, thing. And you know, that all makes sense, right? If you want to access the very last byte of a four kilobyte thing, and you've got 12 bits in which to access it, right? You set FFF in X 12, that'll get you to zero plus FFF the very last byte. All right. And so I had had the thing on here about well, the other virtual memory, aka swapping, aka paging. But, uh, but yeah, the point is, um, I was just saying that you know right now there's nothing really special about these four kilobyte pages, uh, other than to say these are sort of the units that the memory manager in the OS has to use in order to make the hardware happy, right? The hardware will always assume those bottom 12 bits are zero. So if you, the OS memory manager, are, you know, not aligning all of your pages, page directories, and page tables on uh, four kilobyte boundaries, then you're going to have problems. Hardware is going to be accessing different areas, interpreting them as you know, different entries and stuff like that. And so the main point is when we get to what this is setting us up for and what the whole point of virtual memory is, is that you can have you know a limited amount of physical memory, but you can map it to this four gigabytes of virtual memory. And if you run out of physical memory, just go ahead and take one four kilobyte chunk, read it out from physical RAM, write it to the disk, and go ahead and reuse that you know chunk of physical RAM at whatever address it is. Reuse it elsewhere instead of reuse the same virtual memory to physical translation. All right, so now we're drilling down into the actual entries in each of each We saw each has an entry. The major port point is just to get you to the next physical address. But then there's all these different flags which the hardware automatically checks. And so it's the hardware's job to go through and check whether or not this virtual to physical actually makes any sense. Because we said most of the time in that four gigabyte space, there's going to be big old chunks of nothing. Right? You load up a one megabyte executable, yeah, your kernel is mapped into the top part of that, but you know there's like one megabyte. Let's say it's a standalone executable that statically linked has no DLLs, right? So you've got you know kernel stuff in the high memory, one megabyte of your executable in the low memory, and everything else around that is just a bunch of non-mapped virtual physical translations. So with hardware, if you ask for those addresses, right? If you've got erroneous code that asks for the address zero and you have nothing mapped at zero. Hardware is going to see, okay, let's take that linear address to zero, break it down, you know, zeroth index into the page directory. It gets there, and you know, if you're not using it, this entire page ent directory entry is going to be zeros, right? And that means the present bit is going to be zero. The hardware knows when the present bit is zero, it needs to fire off a page fault, put this, put the address of whoever asked for zero into whoever tried to access memory at zero. It's going to take their address of where their EIP is right now, put that into the CR3, or sorry, CR2. and then kick off the page fault, which is a type of interrupt. The OS can handle that page fault and say, you know, look, yes, that's zero there. It's not present, but, and, and actually, sorry, I should say, like for all of these things, present or read, write or user supervisor, if any of those things turn out to like not work out, something's not present, or you're trying to write to a read-only chunk, 
you're trying to ac access supervisor memory from user, all of those are just a page fault. And then it's the OS's job to catch that page fault <clears throat> and go ahead and figure out what it should do about it, right? You know, maybe it wants to kill the process, maybe it can recover. So I guess I'll talk about it later as well, but no, I'll talk about it later. So the key point is when the present bit is zero, the Intel documents say you can go ahead and use those top 31 bits for whatever you want. We said that typically an OS, there will be an OS specific thing where if the OS has, for instance, kicked this chunk of physical memory out or kicked this, you know, entire mapping of physical memory out to disk, then it's going to hold a 31-bit data structure that says where you can find it on disk. And that's just so that it can, you know, automatically and silently read it back into memory the next time someone accesses it. The read-write flag, bit one, is all about whether or not the kernel wants to mark a region of memory as read-only or read-write. And there's definitely good reasons why it would mark something as read-only even if it's writable, so that if someone tries to write to it, they can uh, catch a copy, or they can know that that's uh, happening, and then they can, you know, make a copy for that process and go ahead and um, give one process a new version with the written data and give the other process the shared. So in the, in the, probably a bit premature to talk about it, but there's a notion of what's called copy on write in operating systems. So we talked yesterday about how, for instance, right, we know about this sort of shared memory type things, right? We know that the, pro that the OS would like to map a DLL into physical memory exactly once and then go ahead and map it to different virtual memory classes. But it may be the case that <clears throat> one of those processes goes ahead and tries to write to that DLL, for instance. Especially, well, yeah. One of those processes, let's say process A has this library mapped into memory right here. Oh, man, I, I did have another picture for this and I forgot it. So. Well, actually, I have a good picture which describes this, so I need to copy this over quick. All right, so this is what I'm going to be talking about is a little trick that the operating system does in order to try to share memory as much as possible, but when it finally finds that it can't share memory, so if it knows that at some point, you know, I've got the same physical memory mapped into two different processes, but what should I do if one of those processes writes to that physical memory? Should I make it be the case that every process that has it mapped sees it? Or should I make it be the case that, you know, only the one who wrote to it sees their copy, but everyone else is still isolated? So there's different scenarios there, right? We said in some cases, when you're mapping memory between two things, you do explicitly want them to be, you know, sharing data between that memory or something like that. But in other cases, such as shared libraries, if one process, right, we're trying to enforce isolation between those processes, right? If one process writes to a common DLL, let's say it overwrites some code in that DLL, right? It hooks the code by putting a jump instruction at the beginning, jumping back to their code. Do you want it to be the case that all processes are now modified? The answer is no, because you're trying to, you as the operating system are trying to isolate that. So what it does to enable the memory sharing, but simultaneously prevent the modification in one process of, you know, shared things like libraries, from being viewed across all the processes is it uses something called copy on write. In that case, what the operating system does is it takes that read write flag in the page uh, information, right? So you've got your virtual memory space is all just a bunch of page tables. It takes the page tables which map to these physical addresses and it marks them as read only. If process A goes ahead and writes to one of these, the hardware sees, hey, you're trying to write to a read only page. Page fault, OS, do whatever you want to do about that. Right? And what the OS can do is it can say, aha, right? Post cow, that's post copy on write. The OS can say, look, here was before shared library chunk one. Both of these processes see the same thing. But here's after shared process A wrote to that. It's going to copy this entire chunk 
copy it to some other physical address, make the modifications that was asked for, and then map it into memory. Well, in reality, it maps it into memory, and then it just goes ahead and lets the uh, write continue. It marks that chunk as read-write, and then it lets the hardware continue. The next time the hardware walks in, it'll see, aha, I see that now, you know, this chunk one is marked to this memory, which is chunk one A. That memory is marked as read-write. I can just go ahead and allow the write. Right, so this right here, this versus this, that's how the OS implements copy on write using those page level read write permissions. So it can share stuff ostensibly, but when someone writes to that shared memory, they get their own copy and they think that you know they've written to a shared library and so it should show up across everyone, right? But if you go ahead and do this and you know after this class, once you've got this sort of knowledge, you can just you know open up a user space process with WinDebug. You just use the test process and all that. You can set everything up the same. And just, you know, go find a DLL. You can use LM for load modules, which I think we may see here later, or if not, write it down. <coughs> in WinDebug, you can use LM to list modules in kernel space that'll list a bunch of kernel modules in user space that'll list all your DLLs. When you do that, you can just go in with WinDebug, set the memory window to whatever DLL, write a change to that, and then see, open up a different process with when debugging user space and see whether that change propagated or not. I think for some some locations in memory it does, like read write read write data section, for instance, does, right? Because you want that writable data to, to go between different processes, right? But for other sections it won't. All right, so that was just a digression about you know one of the other things, right? So present can be used to page stuff out to disk. And then page it back in, you know, silently after the OS catches the page fault. Read write can be used to implement this copy on write type of thing in an operating system so that it can share memory, except when someone tries to mess it up and then give them a different copy. It's like, you know. Just thought of the best analogy. It's like you've got this virtual pool space, right? And it's like you take all the kids to the virtual pool and they think they're all playing in the same pool. But when someone tries to pee in the pool, they're copied out to their own pool. And it doesn't affect everyone else. Right? So that's what this is all about, right? No, help.exe can't pee in the pool for all the other processes. Best copy on write analogy ever. All right. So we talked about present, we talked about read write, and then we need to know about user supervisor because this is the big place where actual kernel user space memory separation is implemented, right? We said with segmentation. We don't think you can call or jump or return into the kernel uh, segment to, in order to be, or into the kernel code, even though it's, you know, even though all of memory is mapped into every segment, right? Or the user space gets one big segment for data, one big segment for code, and everything there, everything is there, right? All of the linear address space. But when paging is enabled, you've got this extra protection, which helps you make it so that you can't actually read or write to the kernel code, right, or data. You can no longer read or write because when the kernel is setting up its own virtual memory space and when it's setting up each virtual memory space for all of the little processes like health.exe, uh, going back to this uh, picture on the board, Bill? Bill, can we go to the board? <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, so going back to this, the notion of user versus supervisor flag is such that the kernel has its own virtual memory space that has none of this. So maybe let's break this out into uh, some separate things. As far as the kernel sees the world, the kernel sees the world like like this.
In reality, the kernel does not have every single process all mapped into memory. The kernel has itself mapped into memory in all of its kernel modules. Right? So yes, it can look at all of the memory for those, but only by way of going out, finding its page directory, finding its page table. You know, it's going to have structures that it keeps in order to know when I transition to that guy, what CR3 do I need to set, right? So if the kernel wanted to, it can find its data structures, find the CR3 for that process, go manually walk the tables and look at all the physical addresses for that one or that one or that one. But in reality, in terms of the actual mapping in the page directory and in the page tables, when you're in kernel space, it's just itself. What we see for something like calc.exe is that, like I said before, it has calc.exe and then it's also got kernel. <coughs> this right here <coughs> is set to supervisor level page protection and this right here is set to user level page protection. So the page directory can have all of this, but the kernel protects itself from the calc.exe by setting all of its memory to supervisor only. Therefore, you must be ring 1, 2, or 3, or to, sorry, 0, 1, or 2, in order to access it, or uh, calc, which is set to ring 3, is not able to do it right. So this is the virtual memory space, and layered on top of that, Remember, the virtual memory space is virtual memory space is the linear address space, right? And we know that the entire linear address space in segmentation is all just, you know, this is DPL equals three, base equals zero, limit equals f f f. Okay. So, the reason why the kernel has allowed itself to be mapped into this space, even though it's protected, is so that uh, there's this limited cache of physical, to virtual to physical addresses, as we'll see in a bit once we get past all these scriptures. The reason the kernel has been there is because we know that the kernel exports an API of all those system calls, open file, you know, talk to the network, whatever else, right? So the, the kernel does want this thing to be able to call code in it, right? But it's all, and you know, because they're all in the same uh, ring three, you'd think that it could call to that. But in reality, this is all set as supervisor, so I can't even access the pages. And there's also, you know, different instructions that can execute only if you're ring zero. So when calc.exe wants to transition to uh, when it wants to actually call some kernel code in order to have it do some library function for it, what happens is, we use this one, you get, because we only have very mediated ways to access from ring 3 to ring 0, right? That was a point I was trying to make yesterday. You can get there by interrupts, you can get there by intersegment calls and stuff like that, but whenever you're going ring 3 to ring 0, there's going to be some sort of, you know, well-managed way to get their call gates and stuff like that, right? So using, so the entire API here has to be based on one of those ways to go from a low privilege to a high privilege at some very specific point that the OS exports, right? So what happens here is when this wants to call some kernel code, what it does is it needs to transition from ring three to DPL three into DPL zero. Right? So the virtual memory address space can stay the same. Kernel can be mapped in. But when it does a call from here to there, it needs to transition between rings. And once you're in these rings, then, oh, hey, dandy, this supervisor level protection on the pages doesn't matter anymore because you are ring zero. You can go ahead and access that. So there's actually a ring transfer, even though there's no virtual memory transfer. You change rings, you 
can execute the code in here. You return, right? And when you return, you go back down to ring three, and then again, ring three code can no longer access the supervisor and stuff. So that's what's done for, for all of these processes when they call a kernel function. And the other point is just that at some point, the kernel may say, hey, like I said, the kernel sets a timer. So at some point it says, hey, I caught this timer. That means calc.exe's time is up. So I don't know how I want to put this. Oh, black. So at some point, if the, like a timer fires, you know, then you know, this essentially goes back to there. And then the kernel says, OK, calc.exe, you're done. Now it's time for notepad.exe transitions into a ring three thing with the virtual memory space that still has the kernel in it. If that wants to call any libraries, it's got to transition to ring zero. But not every transition to ring zero is like back to the virtual memory space of the kernel. Right? So you can transition by between rings but still be staying in the same virtual memory space of your process. But at some point you will come back to the kernel. Kernel will be doing managing management things in order to, you know, manage all the different processes to let them pretend that they all have, you know, exclusive access to the CPU. And so that's kind of, um, that's kind of one of the kernel's points. And if you think about it, as I'll make as a point at the end, right, kernel is to processes as hypervisor <coughs> is to OSs, right? So this sort of thing becomes directly relevant for understanding how virtualization systems work, right? Not so much the rings if you're using, you know, hardware-based virtualization because we, I mean, it is in the sense that, you know, if this is, if this is ring zero and this is ring zero over here, right, in the hypervisor world, this would be ring quote negative one, right, and that would be ring negative one. This would be zero and three and inside of them, they'd be doing their own three to, <clears throat> three to zero transitions while they're inside of, you know, yeah, I mean, essentially they do their own ring three to zero transitions. <clears throat> but at some point, kernel would pop back to ring negative one, which would be hypervisor. So, understanding that this stuff directly applies to virtualization systems is a good thing. Does anyone have any questions on this impromptu demonstration here? <laughs> the, uh, the difference between, you know, the kernel's page tables, which it keeps for itself, which it doesn't map any user space processes, versus user space processes, which the kernel keeps one set of tables for every user space process. And it maps itself into those, but it protects itself with supervisors so that the only way you can get the supervisor is changing it so that your ring zero, you now can get the supervisor code, that stuff. So that's kind of how the interplay between segmentation and paging works. Any other questions on that? Yes. All right, so that was just trying to get at the notion. I probably should make some pictures like that for the slides now that I've thought of it. All right, so that was pertaining to the uh, user supervisor flag and how it relates to these protections are much more granular than the segmentation, right? Segmentation could be granular if the OS has wanted to do it that way, but they don't. So segmentation is not what's stopping, for instance, you know, reading code and data from, from kernel space. It's actually the paging which is doing that protection. Because otherwise, you know, the user space, segmentation may prevent the user space from like jumping directly to some code in kernel. But if user space can write code in kernel, they just write whatever code they want in the kernel. And then the kernel will eventually jump back to wherever it jumps back when it transitions to an interrupt handler or something like that, right? And that's why you need to have both the isolation of uh, code execution as well as uh, data access. All right, and then the only little thing, so this is pretty much where we left off yesterday. We got to right here, but um, the only other thing to say about this user and supervisor is that they interact with the flag that we haven't seen before. In CR0, there's something called write protect. It's not a security mechanism, it's a sanity check mechanism. And what it says is, if write protect is set to one, then even supervisor code may not write to read-only memory, right? So the supervisor kernel may write, some, may say, you know, this chunk of code is read-only. 
and then the kernel should not even be able to scribble all over read-only memory. There should be a page fault on that. But if you turn off the write protect flag, then the kernel can just go ahead and write to any. It basically tells the hardware, if I'm supervisor right now, go ahead and ignore whether or not the read-write check is failing. Right? You're saying don't page fault if you're trying to write to a read-only chunk of memory. All right. So that's where we got yesterday. We were saying, you know, we were talking about the interaction between, you know, if your if your pages are marked as user, and you know, at the page directory level, it's marked as read only. If the page table says something is read write, you know, which takes precedence, right? If page directory says read only. Page table says read write. Which is it, right? When you eventually get to that actual page, and the answer is it's whatever is most restrictive, right? It's a least privileged kind of thing. So the answer is page directory overrides. Well, I guess it's not really a least privileged thing. It's just more like whatever comes first, page directory always overrules all of the page tables that are below it. So as you can see in this matrix, if your user and the access type is read only, but the page table says, oh no, I can read write this page. The answer is no, it's read only, and therefore if the hardware tries to execute a write when it's you know trying to write to that linear address and it's walking the tables, then it'll throw up a a page fault because you're trying to write to a read only. And same thing with supervisor. You know, these like stars here have to do with like whether or not the write protect bit is in effect. So, you know, it may say that the thing is always read write, you know, when you're supervisor, right? But in reality, you no, know, it depends on whether or not something may be marked as read only, and if you turn off that write protect bit, then it's writable, but otherwise uh, if write protect is on, it's not writable. So if the flag is not set, so the supervisor doesn't get universal rewrite privileges, and you have a case where <coughs> one says user and the other says supervisor, is it always going to end up as the privilege of supervisor and either read only if either says read only or rewrite? I don't know. What does the table say? Well, the Which table says everything is supervisor rewrite, but I just sort of assumed that that was with the supervisor rewrite bit set because otherwise I couldn't make sense of why it sometimes said. Exactly. It both, it both exactly. says supervisor read only, you get supervisor rewrite. Exactly. This one, for instance, right? Yeah. And that's the point. If something says star next to it, I think you should interpret it as being the fact that if write protect is disabled, then it's read write. If write protect is enabled, anything with a star next to it, you should assume is read only. Except read only, read only. If it's got read only in one column, it's essentially what I'm saying. Well, what I'm wondering is, is does yeah. that mean that everything is always going to be supervisor? If either of them is supervisor, and it's just a question of read write versus read only? Uh, yes, based on okay. this column where it says if one of them is supervisor. So if this one says it's supervisor, well, it's not if anyone says it's supervisor, right? So you can see in this group of things. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. Yep, so if anyone ever has supervisor, whether it's page directory or page table, it always ends up mapping to a supervisor level page. Right? So in that sense, you could have, you know, maybe some boundary case where like a page directory, half of the page directory entries map to page table entries, which are user, half of them map to ones that are supervisor. But that would be a bad case because according to this table, uh, everything would end up as supervisor. So don't do that. Make sure your, your page uh, directories and page tables are completely separate. That's why OSs tend to do things like say, look, everything from 8, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 up is all kernel. Everything from you know, 0 to 7 FFFF is all user space, right? If you go through and you look at indices, if you break those linear addresses down, you will see that you know, one of them hits this page directory entry, one of them hits that page directory entry, and this one will be user and that one will be supervisor, and then everything underneath them, right? Everything else in that virtual memory space that translates from there. User supervisor. <clears throat> All right. So we had a couple little, a couple more uh, flags we have to talk to you real quick. Ones that are not in bold, we don't really care about, but I'm just mentioning. So PWT and PCD, those are again the same kind of caching flags that we saw in the CR3 thing, and we said don't care. A access flag. That's something set to one by the um, hardware every time that it's actually read or written from something. And sometimes the OS will care about that, sometimes it won't. And so the point is, when the OS is filling in each of these table entries, it will set it as zero. 
and then at some point in the future it may come along and say, if that was set to one, I know that the hardware has accessed that, and maybe I need to do something, maybe I don't. There is a good reason for that. I just can't remember that. I seem to remember something about that in the last class, but <clears throat> it's obviously not cool enough like copy on write, so I don't remember. <clears throat> maybe it's the EPOD, zero fill on demand. Those were the same class portion. All right, page size. This then pertains to that page size extension thing we saw back in the CR4. Page size says, hey, for this page directory entry, am I going to a page table or am I going to a huge 4 megabyte page? So this is the key discriminator right now. We're only concerned about we always go to page tables, but yes, the next case we're going to walk through quick is what if instead this went to a 4 megabyte page, what would that look like? But, <clears throat> but basically you can see right now, this is where you're going to have the difference of whether the kernel has something pointing to a giant chunk or whether it's just a page table. And so the kernel, if it sets that to one, it points at a uh, 4 megabyte giant page. So for now, you should assume this is always zero so that you always get to a page table. And then finally, well, not finally, yeah, finally, the global flag. And we said this has to do with the cache. So the cache is named translation look aside buffer or TLB. And you can think of it like what type of translation is it trying to keep in a buffer off to the side? The translation between some specific linear virtual address and some specific physical address. So TLB is you've got this little buffer cache off to the side where the hardware, instead of trying to always walk the page tables first, goes and it says, you know, do I have? I don't have a picture, so we'll, we'll talk about it a little later. But basically, the, the TLB just has a mapping. This virtual corresponds to that physical. And when you change different processes, so if I change from kernel to calc.exe, I may want some of those mappings to get invalidated. I may not. But when I change from you know, calc.exe to notepad.exe, I probably want a bunch of those mappings, right? Because if, if when you're running calc.exe, address 40000, which is like one of the default, is that the default for, I can't remember if that's the default for executables, right? So if you just by default compile some executable, the compiler is going to give it a default base virtual address, right? So if you default compile two executables, they've both got the same base virtual address. And we said before, like in that memory mapping thing, they can have completely different physical addresses at the same virtual address in different tables. So when you transition from calc to notepad, you don't want it to be the case that calc's virtual address for the start of the code translates, or you don't want it to be the case that notepad's virtual address for the start of the code translates back to calc's physical address for the start of the code, right? You're trying to keep them separate, and in order to do that, you want to invalidate these cachings. Because the, you know, obviously the hardware always checks the cache before it has to walk the table. So that's why it's a look aside buffer. It's off to the side. The hardware says, hey, I can see I'm being asked for the virtual to physical translation of you know, whatever, 9001234. And it says, okay, for this, you know, entire, you know, virtual memory thing, 9001, right? Starting with 9001, I walked that once, and I know that that always translates to physical address that starts with, you know, 123 or something like that. 123000. What is the last assumed bytes? And so the hardware is caching that on the first access all the time, but, uh, and it always checks that forevermore after. It says, do I still have a mapping from 9001 to anything? If so, don't bother with the page tables, page directories. Just go directly to that physical address, add in an offset. But uh, the point is, in some cases, like when you're switching between processes, you want to invalidate that cache, right? You want to say, look, hardware, I just changed processes, so you need to rewalk these tables and get a new virtual to physical mapping. When the global flag is not set, whenever you change processes by writing to the CR3, then these translations will get invalidated. When the global flag is set, these will not get invalidated. So, Bill, can we go over to the board again? So you can see if notepad.exe and calc.exe have the same basic virtual address space and that they have some calc or notepad stuff and then the kernel is mapped into all of it. This is where now the kernel is going to mark this as, you know, global equals one 
and you know all of this is global equals zero. So the point here is when I transition from one process to the other, I still want all this kernel stuff to be mapped in because you know I know that they'll still have to do a segment level privilege transfer in order to call things. But I always still am wanting to export this API to user space, right? My system calls are exported to user space. So I want this to be in the cache so that when I move from one virtual memory space to the other, all of this range is already cached in the TLB. So the next, so when calc.exe is done, and we've got a few more colors. Right, Notepad's got its own little thing going on over here. All right, so you transitioned out to kernel. Kernel says, sorry, Cal, if you've run long enough. Time for Notepad. It puts, you know, again, it's exporting this API. It wants Notepad to be able to open files, open network connections, whatever. So it puts itself in memory so that it can call those kernel functions. But it wants it to be the case that the first time it calls one of those kernel functions, the hardware can just, you know, right away go, aha, I see you're trying to access, you know, 8000-1234. I already have that cache. 8001 maps to this physical address. And it already knows that because it already had that happen up here. So global page flags, global pages, global page directories is all about when we're bopping back and forth between different processes, we want to not have to walk new tables when we're accessing a certain amount of memory. The most common case is you want to not have to access new access the tables for the kernel, which is mapped into everyone at the exact same virtual address <coughs> space. So you want it to be the case that for different processes, you always can still access uh, the hardware, get the benefit of those mappings between virtual and physical always being already in the TLB, the translation of the site. And we'll go, so the thing I should say now that I've mentioned the TLB in which, you know, I, I did a better job of this in the other class of bouncing forward and then uh, justifying where we, uh, why we actually care about these sort of things and then like saying, hey, there's something good coming eventually. You just got to stay with me here. Uh, where we're trying to go eventually, this is all an elaborate ruse so that you actually have enough background knowledge to understand this attack. This is from something called Shadow Walker. It was a sort of proof of concept kit thing that was proposed like in 2005. This is from the Frack article. It's also done at like Jeff Dunn and Black Hat and stuff. Shadow Walker exploits the fact that it turns out there's different TLBs, translation look sides from virtual to physical, different TLBs for code access versus data access, right? We already know that there's different notions of code versus data. That's why we have a code segment and a data segment, right? We know the hardware is doing different things when there's code versus data. Turns out when you get to paging, it's doing different things when you have a code page access through virtual memory versus a data access to virtual memory. So what Shadow Walker does is it's going to try to hide itself in virtual memory so that if you scan all of virtual memory, you're a security product, you've got some great signature for both Shadow Walker, you scan all of virtual memory, you will not see it because it takes and it modifies the page directory entries and page table entries and stuff like that so that it modifies it once, it starts executing its own code. In that way, its code access, its virtual memory address to its physical address for its code access will be stored in one TLB. Then it goes back and the next time you try to access it as data, it modifies the page tables so that in the data TLB, the data access maps to a completely different uh, physical address. Same virtual address, different physical address, and it's modifying, you know, potentially the same page tables. But the point is it wants to modify it, you know, just long enough to get it cached wrong in the DTLB and cached right in the ITLB so that the next time some security product comes through and sweeps all of virtual memory, it turns out it's not translating to the physical address where there actually code is. It just translates to some garbage frame there. So, no, I'm not going to explain it now. We'll come back to this, but this is trying to justify where we're going. We're starting to know enough about things like uh, TLBs, virtual memory, translates to physical memory, that you know, we can see the outline of, of where this is coming from. That's kind of 
So would the TLB be adjusted whenever anything swapped out to disk? The TLB is adjusted whenever, anytime a new CR3 is set, the TLB gets adjusted because automatically anything that's not global gets kicked out of the TLB when a new CR3 is set. So obviously, first of all, they would set these as global things so that you know they stay around between things. And the other way that the TLB uh, the other way, yes. The other way that the TLB is modified is there's actually an explicit instruction where you, the OS, can say, for this virtual memory, go ahead and kick out that TLB entry. And yes, as, uh, as Willie's saying, if you, as the OS, are kicking out the thing from physical memory to disk, you better also evict it from the translation lit side bundle, because otherwise, you're mapping to a physical address where you've just copied some other data. You've taken that data, put it off the disk, and you put some new data in there, you don't evict the TLB thing, it'll definitely, the hardware will just say, oh yeah, virtual vet, physical vet, and it'll go to something you've swapped out of disk and reused. So yes, it's on the OS, but when the OS is paging something out to disk, it uses a specific invalidate page instruction where it says, dear TLB, kick out your entries for this virtual address. Good question. All right. So we're ways away from that still. Though. That's where we're going. All right, so we're, we're done with the page directory entry now. We said the major portion of it is that it has a page table base address. That's your big 20-bit chunk of it. It's just trying to get you the physical address of the page table. And in reality, it's the physical address of a page table or a 4 megabyte page, depending on this PS flag, right? So if PS is 0, this is the physical address of page table, if PS is 1, as we'll see in the next section, it's the address of the 4 megabyte page. All right, so now we move on. We found the physical page that we care about for the page table, right? Hardware now takes those middle 10 bits, uses it as an index into this table, and what it comes up with is one of these data structures like this. Looks very similar to the page directory entry. At the present bit again, looks exactly the same way. The hardware may get past the page directory entry and say, aha, there's my page table. And then it gets to the index and it sees, oh, turns out that specific page that would have mapped to is not currently present, right? So for that exact, you know. All right, uh, can we go over to the board quick? It's sort of, I think of it like this. Um, when the hardware gets past the page directory entry, the thing you kind of have to think about is that you've got some big four gigabyte space, right? And so in that first initial page directory, there's however many 1,024 possible things. Four bytes times that 4,000. So there's like 1,000 possible, 1,024 possible entries in the page directory which can point to page table. So from that sense, you can think of every page directory entry covers, you know, one one thousandth of this virtual memory space, right? So pretending that goes up really far, we're going to say, you know, page directory entry of zero covers, you know, this entire virtual memory space, right? And page directory entry of one covers this entire virtual memory space. That, that, that for, you know, 1,024 possible entries because it's 4,096 bytes. It's a 4 kilobyte page directory. Right, so they cover each of these things. But then for each of those pieces in there, then 1 1,000th of this is covered by a page table entry right, of the virtual memory space. So that's page table entry of 0, page table entry of 1, about that, right? So if you get past the page directory entry level sanity checks of is this present, that's just telling you somewhere in this, you know, one thousandth of the, the full virtual memory space, there is a page directory entry that's probably going to be valid. All right? And if you don't even get past that, that means like that entire one thousandth of virtual memory, like there's nothing there. I as the OS have never put anything there. But you get past that and now you need to go to the page table and you say this, you know, one millionth of the address space, right? One million because you got four kilobyte things. The page table is talking about four, we've got four gigabytes times four kilobytes. Right, four gigabytes divided by four kilobytes equals like one million. So 
So anyways, you get past these sort of sanity checks, and you get down to, you found a page table, but when you get to the page table entries, you still got to say, you know, does this actually point at an actual page? So down here, these are actual pages or frames, right? So each page table entry points at a specific frame, which is 1,000 of this 1,000 of controlling space. You get past the sanity check, now you got to actually check here. And when you think about it in terms of a linear address, I may have, you know, some kernel address, which is 8001234.5, something like that, right? We know that it's taking these uh, top 10 bits here and top 10, the middle 10 bits there, and then these 12 bits there. So getting past that page directory entry just tells you there's something in, you know, this 80, <coughs> it's not like 80 when you take the bits, but, you know, that 1,000 from the chart, it tells you there's something in the range of, you know, 80, can do it accurately. There's two bits. You can go from eight zero zero dot 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 or x x x x x. There's something in that range to eight zero. I think this should be half of f. And so we did seven. Yeah, seven. Right? The fact that you got past this right here is telling you there's something somewhere in the virtual memory address range of 800 dot 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 dot, 807 dot 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 dot. There's something in that range somewhere, but you don't know if, you know, for instance, 803 dot 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 is, you know, this is 800, this is 807, is 803, is there anything even filled in? That's why you're going out to this page level check page direct page table checks and the hardware needs to check once again, is this even present, right? No, this simply could be not there, right? And this could be there. So you get past the page directory, you still got to deal with the page table to know, is that virtual memory space even mapped to any physical memory? Right? Because page directories cover, you know, huge chunks of the space and it tells you there's something there somewhere, the OS you know, put in a page directory and then put in a page table for that, but it doesn't tell you anything about any of the rest. So now you need to take the middle 10 bits, go to the index, the page directory, the page table, and find out if that page table entry even maps to anything. But anyways, otherwise, these first three things, they all work exactly the same as the page table checks, the directory checks. This is where it gets fun because I have to keep switching between these PTEs and PDEs and you got PDE, which checks the PDE. So we got past the checks for page directories. The hardware is now going to do the exact same sort of checks on the page table entries. So say, is it present? If not, page fault. Are you trying to write to read-only memory? If so, page fault. Are you trying to access supervisor memory from user space? If so, page fault. Right? The OS has to deal with all those page faults, doing copy on write. Maybe sometimes it's just about like expanding your stack because you need a new extra page worth of data for your stack. Maybe sometimes you page something out to disk, that sort of thing. So I'll relist some of the examples of how the OS can handle page faults or not handle page faults. But anyways, those are all the same. Uh, where things differ a little bit here, but not in any way that we care about, is again, we've got caching level stuff we don't care about. We've got access flag we don't care about, but the hardware sets that to one automatically the first time it walks through that table to say, look, I've read or written to this location. But the dirty flag, which is specifically now saying it has been written to. So if the OS cares that that's, this memory has been written to, you know, uh, it'll check that flag, which the hardware automatically sets the first time it executes a write into the specific uh, physical address, which this points to eventually. Uh, PAT extends those caching things. Don't care about that. Available. This is available for use. Let's see if that says. This is available for use by the operating system. We got a couple free bits there, so if you want to layer in any other special meanings, go ahead. I feel like Windows does actually use this. I can't, I never got around to digging into it. And yeah, I, let's see, back in the page directory, I forgot to say that in the page directory entry too. There's like some available bits here and one available bit there. 
I think Windows uses that, but I've never dug into it. Not sure on that. So the only real thing we care about again is the notion of global flag. And we said this does count here. It doesn't count at the previous level because it doesn't make sense to, to you know, cache a mapping from a virtual address to a page table, right? Because that's what you would be doing. If you do it back at the page directory entry, it's like you'd be taking this physical address of a page table and mapping, you know, this virtual address goes to that page table. We don't care about that. We care this virtual address goes to that page. So at this level, global flag is ignored unless it turns out that you're actually not pointing at a page table, you're pointing at a big 4 megabyte page. As we'll see again when we go and talk about 4 megabyte pages. Alright, so at the page table entry level though, it definitely matters. If the global flag is set, it, you're telling the hardware, look, when you walk this table once and when you put it into the TLB, go ahead and mark that little entry in the TLB as global so that the next time you're switching CR3, you, the hardware, don't automatically evict it, right? Because the hardware is updating the cache. When CR3 gets set, hardware goes through the TLB and says, okay, global, leave it, global, leave it, non-global, kick it, global, leave it, right? So that automatically happens every time you write to the CR3 register. As, like we said, you don't want notepad.exe's virtual addresses translating to calc.exe's physical addresses. So you've got to kick those mappings out. And again, we finally got to the point where we're now at the page base address. So page table entries say, here is the physical page you looked for. This four kilobytes of physical memory corresponds to those four kilobytes of virtual memory that you're trying to access. And finally, you know, okay, I didn't have it. Finally, when you get to that page, you just take those last 12 bits and add it to the physical address book, you meaning the hardware. Hardware adds the last 12 bits in the virtual address, the last 12 bits in the physical address, and bang, you've got the actual data that you're looking for. All right. So <clears throat> any questions on this so far, we're going to do a little lab on using the PTE plugin for WinDebug, which will show sort of how Windows is actually mapping. It'll, it'll just basically parse out, here's the page directory entry, here's the page table entry, this is what they look like for this virtual memory address. So, but before we do that, going back to this notion, we've now seen, you know, physical address here points to that directory. Physical address there points to that table. Physical address there points to that page. And each of those entries has a bunch of things the hardware is supposed to check, like, is it even present? Are you trying to write to read only? Are you trying to access supervisor stuff from using it? That sort of thing. As well as caching stuff you don't care about and things like global, so that the hardware can automatically mark stuff in its cache as global or not. Does anyone have any questions on any of the entries, any of the bits, stuff like that? Anyone on the phone got anything? All right, then we are going to do this PTE lab here quick. And Corey, after this, we will get to the point of how Windows implements the conventions. All right. So, let's see. Do people have WinDebug still open from yesterday? Yes, 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 yes. Mario, still open? People on the phone. Okay, Jessica has no, Adam, no. All right. So I will quickly go through opening WinDebug again. For yesterday. All right. So, if you don't have it open, so I'm just going to continue this thing. Everyone who has it open, don't worry about this. All right. So, what we're going to do as yesterday, we're going to, I'm going to shut this down uh, and kill it. All right. And for the people who said no, Adam and Jessica, do you have? You got it to work yesterday, right? Everyone got it to work yesterday. Adam. Adam, did you get it to work yesterday? People who have it working, you can uh, look at the slides and stuff and start going through it if you want, but obviously I'll be there. 
All right. <clears throat> For Jessica, uh, open up WinDebug and select kernel debug. All right, you want to have the same settings as you should have the same settings as yesterday, slash, slash, dot, slash, pipe, slash, whatever. And with the pipe box checked, you don't hit OK yet. What you're going to do is you're going to go over to the virtual machine. And your settings should be the same as yesterday. So you hit play virtual machine. When it gets up to the boot screen, you're going to go ahead and just, you're going to hit return. And then you're going to quickly go out and hit OK over in current mode. So hit return at the boot screen for the debugger enabled. Then I go out and I hit OK in the kernel debugger. And it should, uh, it should get a hold of the uh, virtual machine. You may have to hit control alt in order to you know, get your keys to escape from the virtual machine. Then the virtual machine should be booting and your kernel debugger should be attached. All right. So what we're going to do for people, if you already have it at the command window, that's fine. If not, go to debug and break. That will allow you to enter command, command window. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a specific virtual address, and we're going to see how that translates to physical address. And you know, just for whatever sake, I decided to use the GDT address, the base address in linear memory, virtual memory of the GDT. And that's in our GDTR register. Right? So if you go over to your registers, you should see that the GDTR is set to 800-3F00. I'm going to double click on that. Copy it, and then we're going to do bang, PTE, and then paste that in there. So exclamation point, PTE, and then uh, paste that in there. And I'm just going to go around and look. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I think I forgot to say yesterday to put in our symbols, and this won't work unless we have symbols. So you need to go to File. Symbol file path. All right, now let's see if I've done this enough that I completely remember it. it. Should be SRV, capital SRV, star, uh, C colon, Windows, symbols. I think it really doesn't matter where you put it. But this path right here is saying I'm going to download symbols from the Windows symbol server and I'm going to cache them in C colon Windows symbols. And then the address of the Windows Server is HTTP. And make sure you have the star again after C colon Windows Server star, or C colon Windows Symbols, star, HTTP colon slash slash. Uh, I think it's DL, uh, Microsoft, no, MSDL. MSDL.microsoft.com slash download, plural, Windows plural. No, I'm on singular. Symbols plural. All right, then you want to check the reload checkbox and hit OK. <coughs> Excuse me. Like hit OK. You should see, if everything is succeeding, you should see something like connected to Windows XP and then it's going to have dot, 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 dot as it uh, downloads the symbols. So. Yeah, so for everyone who had it up, too bad for you. Turns out I forgot. For this right now, we need to, this, by default, this VM boots into PAE mode. And we are looking at, you know, translations still in 32 to 32, 4 kilobyte, non PAE. So everyone needs to close their window bug. Right. Can we save our work? Yeah. 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 You can save your workspace so that it won't. Uh, that it won't, it'll just come back to the same thing. Although I don't know if that's actually going to work different PAE versus not. I think it may consider it different enough. Did yours have all of the organization when we debug connected? All right. So yeah, power off your VM, hard power it off. I don't care. Virtual machine, power, power off. <coughs> Then you want to open WinDebug, all programs, debugging tools, WinDebug. <coughs> WinDebug, select File, Kernel Debug. 
We should be just sitting here at this frame and moving. So, all right, everyone should be sitting here with their uh, wind debug waiting to kernel debug and your virtual machine currently off. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do the same as before. We're going to hit play and we're going to hit OK, but we're not going to hit the first entry. We go down to the next entry. It says non-PA. So play your virtual machine. Move down one thing. Once you move, the little 30-second countdown stops so you don't have to worry about timing. So move down to this middle entry that says no PAE and debug enable. Okay, so is everyone on the phone at this point right now? So before we continue on, I want to make sure everyone on the phone is at the boot screen, waiting to turn on the waiting to boot into the non-PAE version, and then uh, and then we're going to hit OK, and then we're going to jump out and hit OK in the kernel debugger. All right, so we're going to just hit OK inside the VM. Hit OK, hit Control Alt to get out, and then go ahead and hit OK over in Win Debug. There, yeah. See, I got my environment right. back up still. FYI, if you're ever worried about like losing all your four windows and stuff, you can go to File and uh, Save Workspace. I can try this. All right, for everyone who's sitting there with the debugger saying, you know, debugging not connected and stuff like that, what you can go ahead and do now is go to Debug and Break. That'll break into the, deb uh, the debuggy, hopefully. There you go. And then, as I said before, we're just going to go over to the registers window and grab the GDTR once it comes up. Good, my symbols are still there. We're going to copy and paste the GDTR, which is like 8003F0, 0, 0. You'll be bang, PTE, and paste it, but we're not going to hit OK yet because we need to make sure that all of your symbols are loaded successfully. Actually, even I'm not even going to put that just to make sure. All right, so right now, everyone, if you go to the symbol file path, file, symbol file path, all right, do you still see the uh, the debugging uh, path in there? Everyone on the wind, on the uh, phone, can you sound off on that? If you've got that, that path in here, debugging symbols, it's also in your slides if you can't see the, uh, can't see the video very good. Yeah, it's in the slides. It is in the slides. Unfortunately, it's back in the version. Uh, it's in the first portion of the slides. So if you go back to the section one stuff, back when there's like the GUI pictures of uh, you know setting up WinDebug. Back there, there's going to be one called getting kernel symbols, uh, getting kernel debug symbols, and that's going to happen. Plot is SRV star C4. Okay. Yep, exactly. Thank you for posting that. You don't actually need uh, really the C4 and Windows symbols at the beginning. I think it uh, is smart enough to know to inside the cache first, although I certainly do that for a while as well. All right. Okay, and you will potentially see errors when you like click reload and OK. But that's just saying there's some third-party modules right now which you can't actually find. So on mine, it says couldn't load the symbol for Intel PPM. That says that's just saying this is going out and consulting the Microsoft symbol server, which pulls down the bug symbols for Microsoft things. So yeah, if there's things like VMCI or other things which are third-party VMCI is like VMware kernel modules that for uh, VMware tools. If, if you see errors with respect to that, just saying you can't load the symbols, then that's fine. Uh, just one thing you can quick do just to uh, sanity check that everything's working. Um, you can type dot reload and press return. So if you type dot reload and press return, it should again do this sort of thing where it does dot 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 as it's loading the different symbols. If it if you do dot reload and press return and it says like then it says an error message like can't find symbol server or something, then that's bad. But just errors cannot find things, it's fine. All right, and so when everyone thinks they have their symbols loaded, just go ahead and again hit that bang PTE, and then the 8003F000. 
Right? So this is saying, okay, look, we've got a register. This register points at the base address of the global descriptor table, right? When paging is not turned on, right, in the early boot of the system, when you're in real mode, that register would have just specified, this is a linear address, go ahead and map directly to physical memory. Once we turn on paging, now this is a virtual address, and it maps through the page tables some way, somewhere, to physical memory, right? And so what this PTE command is going to do is it's going to say, okay, I'm going to break up this address the same way the hardware does, 10, 10, 12, and I'm going to go ahead and go to the page directory based at CR3, go index 10 in, and I'll show you literally what the CR, what the page table entry, page directory entry was. Then I'll go to the next one, show you the literal page table entry, etc. So go ahead, issue that command. You shouldn't type a slash like that. Like I did. So it's saying, okay, you asked me for virtual address 8003F000. PDE is that virtual memory address C0300800. So it turns out Windows has a specific convention that it uses in order to find all of the physical addresses for page directories, page tables, and stuff like that. They have a convention they use in order to find that in virtual memory because we said CR3 is a physical address. Page table entry has a physical address. Page directory entry has a physical address. So Windows, as long as paging is turned on, can't just go directly to those physical addresses, you know, update these directory entries, table entries. It needs to have some sort of virtual memory mapping so that when it wants to get to that physical address, it's at a known virtual address. And so we'll see how it implements that in a second. But for now, you can just sort of know that it turns out when you have, uh, when you have, well, I can just say it. All page directories start at C's, well, the page directory always starts at, on this non-PAE code, C03000000. So that's always where it maps the page directory in virtual memory. For every different, uh, for every different virtual memory space, for every, for the kernel, for all the user space processes, for all of those tables, it always makes sure that the base directory itself in physical memory is mapped at a constant virtual address so that it can always find it based on that. Same thing for page tables. They're always mapped at C0000. So we'll come back to understanding how it does that and how we can calculate the virtual addresses of these you know, physical addresses stored in page table entries. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But for now, it suffices to say that this command knows how to, it knows that convention, and it knows that if it wants to find the page directory entry for these top 10 bits, it needs to go to the virtual address C0300800. Right. So we're going to figure out how we can map stuff to, we can know how PTE is working. And so it says, all right, the entry itself is at this virtual address. The entry is a four byte structure, right? And so it says this is the literal entry. This is the page table entry. Right, so if we take this 0003B163 and we break it up, we can interpret it the way the hardware will interpret it. The bottom bit is the present bit, right? And so is the present bit set on this? Yes, present bit is set on this. All right, a little trickier. The second bit is the read-write bit. Is this readable or writable? Or sorry, is this readable, read-only or read-write? Remembering that zero means read only, one means read write. It's read write. It's read write. Yes, right? Because it's three in binary is one one zero zero or hex, right? So three hex is one one zero zero in binary. So that means the next bit is the user supervisor bit. It is currently set to zero. And well, so I should have should have said what does what is it, but what is it right now? Is this user or supervisor memory? This is supervisor memory. If it's set to one, it's user. If it's set to zero, it's supervisor. And that entirely makes sense. You don't want your G your global descriptor table as user memory, right? So this is how the kernel is protecting the memory where the global descriptor table is, right? You don't want user space code to screw up your segmentation. Otherwise, it'll say, oh yeah, my segment is now DPL zero. Gold. All right, so that's the little address. We can translate all the rest of the things if we want. 
But the main thing is that if we take the bottom 12 bits, which in hex are the bottom three sort of nibbles, three characters, take those bottom 12 bits and just assume those are zero, and take the upper 20 bits, and that's the you know, start part of the actual physical address where the page table is. Right? So 3B000 in hex is the physical address of where the page table is. And so now you want to go to that page table, take the middle 10 bits, offset into it, look at the literal thing, right? So again, we can't, we, neither we nor the hardware can just, you know, go directly to that physical address. So it sets up some sort of convention that it uses for mapping that physical address to a known virtual address. And because of that, it knows that it needs to find the entry at C02000 F, uh, FC. And when it goes to that virtual memory space, this is again, underneath it, it has the literal page table entry, right? So we can interpret all the bits, bottom bit, present. Yes, it's set. Good. We have a virtual to physical mapping. Next bit, read write. It's set as read write. It's also supervisor. And again, now we can take, get rid of, not even care what those bottom 12 bits are, assume those are zero, and say, okay, I know that this physical page that this location is stored at is 3F000, right? And that way you can find the base page, and it turns out that right now the virtual memory address we've asked for is already page aligned, right? So if we wanted this address, the bottom 12 bits of this PTE, right? Remember it breaks it up 10. So like, you know, there's 10 kind of here, it goes halfway into that nibble. There's 10 kind of here, it goes halfway into that zero nibble. And then these bottom 12 are used as an offset. But right now the bottom 12 are zero. Right, so the data you want is zero offset into physical address 3F000. That is where in physical memory you can actually find the GT, global descriptor. Now, it's trying to do some helpful things for you down here by interpreting the flags, but you know, you kind of have to go look up what each of those mean. Like this V, that's the present bit. What does it stand for again? Someone think of me, think a synonym for present valid. Oh, yes. Or it's available valid. if there's a It could. Yes, valid. It's saying this translation through this entry is valid. The next part. Uh, e. Uh, so ridiculous. Come on now, just tell us the bits. All right, so FYI, when you need to look up, you know, stuff in WinDebug, this help is extremely useful. There's like a ton of stuff, so it's hard to always find what you're looking for, but you want to go to help and search. And so for instance, right now I want to see what this translation is for bang PTE. Right, bang PTE. I search. Oops. Right, and the top entry was bang PTE. I can double click on that. I can go down here and I can find, okay, here's its little translations of flags. So, E means it's an executable page, which is interesting. I think it's saying that because right now we're not booted into PAE, there's no such thing as non-executable, so all pages are executed until we go into PAE mode. V for valid, that's bit. See, that's even worse. They're calling it bit one, but it's, you know, bit index zero, according to the Intel manual. But anyways, the first bit is valid. The next one is, and yeah, then for whatever reason, they decide to put E in between the valid and the uh, read write. But it's executable and, going back to the thing, next one says W for writable. So, okay, it's read write, not just read only. So anyways, if you want, you can learn these flags and understand them that way. Or, you know, make your own plugin, which translates it and prints it out your own way. You know, take that plugin I already have, just modify it. It's like, like I said, I'd never done a plugin before. I just took an existing one and I said, okay, well, here's how it's accessing the GDTR. So now I can add in the IDTR, right? And I'll just use that basic code. Similarly, you could use it to, you know, access the CR3. And use that to get to a physical memory. Once you know the virtual, the physical memory translation. Yes, question. Say what? What is write through? That's again one of those caching things that we don't care about. So that had to do with those PCT and the gear. Yep. yep. Cache disabled and write through. Is that? I don't know. Write through. Cache disabled, write through. Those. If you go back and look at bits 8 and 10, which are index 7, and uh, 10 is actually 16, so index 15. 
Well, it's 15 in that That's 16. All right, anyways, you can look that up and stuff. But the point right now is we've got a command which will let us go ahead and for any virtual address, look at the page directory entry, page table entry. So let's, for instance, look at, you know, zero, right? We said that generally speaking, nothing is mapped to zero. Right? It should be invalid. So the question is, where is it invalid? Is it invalid at the page directory entry level or is it invalid at the page table entry? All right, so we go ahead and do that. All right, it looks like for the PDE, there is a virtual address and it does contain something. And when we look at this thing, it's 7 and 7 is 111, so we know that the least significant bit is set. This is present, so that means there is something in that bottom thousandth of memory, right, that is actually mapped. But we then find the physical address at physical address 2040 and then assume 000 at the last part because it's always page aligned. So 2040000, we went to that physical address and we find out that, oh, it turns out that there, the PTE for that is at this uh, virtual address, but the literal value contained in that PTE is all zeros. So it's not present. If you were to try to access this, the hardware would translate it just like this PTE command and say, bang, okay, PTE, got it. PTE, nope, not valid, page fault. Right? OS catches it, OS, OS says, oh, well, you know, are those top 31 bits? Does it look like one of my data structures for page down to disk? No, it looks like nothing. So fail, you know, send down a kill process, commit process, whatever you want to do about that. In reality, I think it gives the application a chance to, right, so we have fault handling and it's a pressure exception handling. We've got exception handling where when the process screws up, it can register things to like try to fix that itself, right? So the OS says, okay, I see you screwed something up. Hey, do you have any way to fix that, right? So you can register, you can say, if I divide by zero, it turns out that causes an interrupt, right? So oh, maybe the thing will say, oh, well, if I accidentally divide by zero, OS, please just let me know. I'll go ahead and fix that up and skip that instruction or something. Similarly, page faults, you know, it maybe is going to uh, give it a chance to recover, but probably not this case. Did we take our break yet? No, we didn't. So time for a break, a uh, 10 minute break. Anyone have any questions before we go? Or PTE?